All right, you guys still hanging in there? I know. I know y'all are tired. Y'all woke up early. I am too. I'm extremely tired. But here I am assisting my beloved students so that they can pass EMT and be very good corpsmen and med techs, you know, because I don't have a life. I'm such a big loser, right? Here with y'all losers as well. I mean, students as well. So let's go over chapter 19. Oh, stop. Stop being sensitive. It was a joke. Shut up. It's a chat box. All right, um, diabetic emergencies and altered mental status. One of my favorite chapters, right? Diabetic emergencies, because these people, we assume that they're crazy, but they're actually not. It's just because they forgot to eat something. Just like the scenarios that I sent to y'all, right? They forgot to eat toast, they forgot to eat breakfast and lunch, and now they're all grumpy, right? So, have a reticular activating system, the RAS, page 532. Reticular activating system is responsible for you staying awake, paying attention, and sleeping. So for those of you that fall asleep in the class, <laughs> um, your, your, your reticular activating system is probably not functioning correctly. <clears throat> you too, Hunter Davis. Um, sorry, I thought I just mentioned, blurted out names in the class. But anyway... Um, we noticed that if they have an altered mental status, right, if um, altered mental status during their primary assessment, right, we're determining their level of consciousness um, during their, um, the primary assessment. Sir, what is your name? Where are you? What time is it? And if they answer all three, they are ANO times three. Anytime they don't answer one of those questions, ANO times two, ANO times one, ANO times zero, your patient is considered to have an altered mental status, okay? Right. So how do we know if they have an altered mental status besides the um, alertness? Well, we have the AVPU acronym, right? If they're not alert, then we're going to introduce verbal stimuli. Sir, if you can hear me, can you please squeeze my fingers or blink your eye? Painful stimuli, if the verbal doesn't work, painful by rubbing, the, um, rubbing their sternum or pinching their shoulder. Um, the book also suggested like pinching their finger or their nail beds. And if they don't respond at all, then your patient is considered unresponsive. Right, for the secondary assessment, same thing, OPQRST ample and clarifying questions still apply on this one. Um, the most important thing that you can ask is, um, especially if they're a pediatric patient, because pediatric patients, um, when we say pediatric, like 12 year olds, um, 12, 13 year olds, they can also have type, um, type one or type two diabetes. So some, or uh, even young kids. So on the page, on page 534, it says right there, on page 534, uh, on the pediatric note, it says there, right there, one thing that you can assess, because sometimes it's hard to assess their AB or their ANO as pediatric patients, you can ask the parents, are they acting out of the ordinary? Is this their normal behavior? Because if the parent says, no, this is not the, how they usually act, that's probably a sign of an altered mental status for um, when it comes to pediatric patients. That makes sense, everyone? So that's how you quickly assess for mental status of your patient. So let's talk about the main emergency on this specific chapter. Diabetes, AKA Paula D, okay? So diabetes, um, there's um, the main reason, uh, the main thing for diabetes, there's two types of emergency. Um, hypoglycemia and hyperglycemia. So glucose is what your body needs, right? <clears throat> your body needs glucose in order to convert ATP into energy. And glucose is absorbed by your cells through insulin. The only part of your body that does not need insulin is your brain cells, or your brain cells. Your brain cells do not need insulin. It easily absorbs it. That's why when you're hungry and your friend gives you like Snickers or like candy or a piece of something, you feel the effect real quick, but it's a temporary thing. And then you're back to being hungry because the brain absorbs the sugar temporarily through your mucous membranes, through the blood vessels in your mouth, and then, you know, it takes a while to get into the digestive system. That's why they say it's like, you still need to eat if you're feeling extremely hungry because the candy and those bars are just temporary effects, okay? So there's two types of diabetes, okay? Diabetes in general, medical term for that is diabetes mellitus. There's two types. We have type one and type two. Type one are those individuals that do not have enough insulin or don't have insulin at all. That's why they have to inject insulin on, their, on themselves. Type two is they have insulin in their body, but their body doesn't know how to utilize it. So it's basically pointless, right? So those are your type two diabetes. Type two diabetes is usually because of improper diet and 
inactive sedentary lifestyle. So if you're not exercising, you know, your diet consists of, you know, Domino's pizza, um, you know, you're always buying those Chick-fil-A burgers and whatever they sell on those things. That's the recipe for diabetes, right? Um, but hey, no judgment. Diabetes is good. Okay, diabetes is good because it's really, really good. Okay, because it tastes good. So there's two types of diabetic emergencies that you have to be concerned with, hypoglycemia and hyperglycemia. Hypoglycemia is when there's low blood sugar. Simply put, um, the, when you check their blood glucose levels, anything that is, um, that's concerned below, I believe below 60 on your textbook, will, um, yes, below 60 would be considered um, symptomatic, right? Um, hypoglycemia. Um, another thing about this too, it's, it's a rapid onset, right? Hypoglycemia, your brain is very sensitive when there is low amounts of glucose. So that's why when you're hungry in class and you decided not to eat breakfast or when it's time for lunch, you just stop listening to the instructor up front. You're just like, I do not, I'm hungry. Let's each one you shut up, I'm hungry. Because the onsets are very quick. You start to become irritable, right? Your brain is, that's basically your brain sending the message, you know, it's time to get that glucose and energy into your body, okay? Hyperglycemia is high blood sugar, okay? This is more, it t this takes a while to take it to take it into place, right? So that's their main difference. Hyperglycemia, right away. Hyperglycemia takes about a couple of days, right? Sometimes a couple of hours for it to take effect. How do you know your patient hyperglycemia besides their blood, in addition to their blood glucose levels? Well, their patient is gonna have excessive thirst, right? They're gonna be extremely, uh, they're extremely hungry and they're gonna pee a lot, right? And another thing too, when you smell their breath, it's gonna smell fruity. It's going to have, they're going to have that fruity breath as well. So those are the signs and symptoms of hyperglycemia. And if hyperglycemia is not controlled, uh, it can turn into diabetic ketoacidosis. That's when the fats are being burned and turned into glucose, right? Because overall, fat can be broken down into glycogen. Then glycogen gets broken down into glucose. And then glucose gets broken down um, into energy. So, but the fact that is your fat should not be in a normal patient who is not experiencing high amounts of stress. The fat should be just reserved. Okay. But if your patient is um, experiencing diabetic ketoacidosis, it's going to start converting those fat and it's going to start producing acetones. And that's why you're going to smell that acetone breath. Okay. And you're going to smell also fruity breath when it comes to diabetic ketoacidosis of your patient. Okay. Also known as DKA in the medical field. Okay. So how do you assess your patient? Nothing different, same thing. Um, G primary assessment, GLC, ABC, TP, OP, QRST, and AMPLE for your secondary assessment. For your focused physical exam, however, you're gonna conduct a blood glucose check, okay? So if you think that it is a diabetic emergency, conduct a blood glucose check right away, okay? In your textbook, it says right here, below 60, that's symptomatic diabetic, diabetes less than 50 milligrams, right, five zero, most, uh, most of the time this is significant, right? These are like 42, 48, 46, that is way too low and your patient's probably gonna be, have a severe altered mental status. Um, uh, greater than 140, um, that's probably gonna indicate hyperglycemia, so 140 and above, and we're basing this all in your textbook on page 540, and then greater than 300, that's probably a significant, right? That's a significant hyperglycemia and it's probably gonna cause severe dehydration with your patient and other serious symptoms, okay? So once we've done our focus physical exam and our baseline vital signs, we're gonna call medical direction for permission to intervene and transport. Well, your medical direction says, okay, well, what's your plan? What are you gonna give your patient? What can we give our patient for a diabetic emergency? What is the one medication that you can get? Anybody? What's that one medication that we can get for diabetic emergencies? Oral glucose. oral glucose, right? That's basically it, oral glucose. Oral glucose is something that we give our patients regardless if it's hypoglycemia or hyperglycemia. Please do remember that, ladies and gents. Regardless if it's hypoglycemia or hyperglycemia, we're gonna give them um, oral glucose because even though they're hyperglycemic, you giving the oral glucose will not kill them because like I said, it takes a while for the onsets to kick in for hyperglycemia. You're just treating the signs and symptoms of it because for somebody with hyperglycemia, 
the sugar is in the bloodstream. It's not going into the brain, right? So that's why you give them oral glucose to at least feed the brain cells some sugar, okay? So it's not going to kill your patient, okay? So please do remember that. It's hypoglycemia and hyperglycemia are treated exactly the same in a pre-hospital setting. So what are the indications of um, oral glucose? Well, of course, they have to have altered mental status and they have to have history of diabetes and they need to be able to swallow, okay? Contraindications are all, everything, all, all the opposite of those things. They're unconscious, they cannot swallow, right? And then for dosage, you're gonna give the whole two. Okay? You're gonna give the whole oral glucose two and it's basically gonna increase the patient's blood sugar, okay? Might take a while, but they're gonna see the effects right away because like I said, the sugar molecules, some of those are going into your bloodstream right, through the mouth, all the way up to the brain cells, okay? That makes sense, everyone. Any questions so far? Very good. Okay, so going on page 542, that it's, there it is. It differentiates it again, hypoglycemia and hyperglycemia. Hypoglycemia, at onset of it, it, hyperglycemia is a slower onset. Hypoglycemia is a rapid onset. For the skin, hyperglycemic, it's gonna be red, warm, and dry. For hypoglycemic, it's going to be pale, cool, and moist. And then for their breaths, um, hyperglycemia is the only one that's going to have that acetone or fruity breath. And then the hypoglycemia, you're probably not going to um, smell anything out of that one. Okay? So that's basically the difference between hypo and hyperglycemia. Any questions about that class? Uh, question is, type 1 or type 2, what's the most common? Um, honestly, I think, I believe it's type 1. Um, based, just, I'm just basing this on experience alone. Um, most of the patients that I've encountered were type 1 diabetes because older patients are the ones that are, when you get patients in the EMT field, they're probably going to be a geriatric patient that do have type 1 diabetes and they're going to have their insulin pumps or they're probably going to have, um, they're probably currently in insulin medications. Okay. Right, so any questions for that class? Great. Let's move on. Um, other causes of altered mental status, okay? Yes, please mute your microphones, everybody, if you're not muted yet. So this one, I'm just going to quickly go over what are the different causes of altered mental status. Um, so first one is sepsis. Sepsis is just a general infection of the body, okay? So this is, it starts with, it can start with a respiratory infection, or it could be a UTI, or it could be a surgical wound that didn't hear properly and then it, the infection goes into the bloodstream and it spreads through your body. So that's called sepsis. So when that happens, it can also affect the functions of the brain. Um, so it can, cause some, um, it can cause some altered mental status because it's gonna, affect, uh, it's gonna affect how your brain functions, right? Then you also have seizures, okay? There's two types of seizures, partial and generalized seizures. Partial, only one part or one side of the brain. Generalized is both sides of the brain because you have the left brain and the right brain, okay? The left controls the right side of your body, the right controls the left side of your body. So under the generalized seizure, the most common type of generalized seizure that you're gonna encounter is called the tonic-clonic, okay? So the tonic-clonic, there's three phases to that. Tonic is when the body becomes rigid. Clonic is when your body starts jerking. Posticle is when it stops, okay? So tonic, rigid, clonic, jerking, posticle, stop. Make sense, everybody? Okay, pick out keywords, okay, keywords. So ton tonic, rigid, clonic, jerking, postical, stops, okay? And sometimes when patients get, um, get seizures, they have a thing called, what is that A word? They get aura, right? They get that aura. They stop and they look at just like, oh my gosh, I feel it coming, right? Most of the time, patients can sense it, right? And yes, for those of you that are about to, I'm just gonna put it out there, yes, there are dogs that are trained to like, or they can sense um, when a patient's about to have a seizure. Why? I do not know. I do not talk the dog language. I will let you know once I find that out. Right. But do you, it is true. Animals, some animals are trained, specifically dogs, to detect aura. Okay, so what, um, what causes seizure? It could be hypoxia, okay, because of low oxygen, stroke, um, TBI, traumatic brain injury. It could be hyperglycemia. It could be congenital brain defects. Um, it can be an infection, right? So there's a lot of reasons. There's not just one reason of why a patient is going to start having seizure. Um, another, uh, another term for uh, seizures, there's, um, 
there's the thing called epilepsy, okay? Epilepsy is just a, basically an umbrella term when the patient is having multiple seizures. So that means they're having back-to-back-to-back-to-back-to-back -to -back -to -back -to -back -to -back seizures. That's called an epilepsy. Seizures can last um, 30 seconds per, um, per episode or probably 45 seconds, probably a minute, right? But they're in increments. If it happens multiple times, that's going to be called an epilepsy. Well, what can you do if a patient is having seizure? Are you going to put something in their mouth? No, right? But our, what did our parents and grandparents tell us? Oh, make sure they bite on a spoon. Make sure they bite on, a, on something hard. No, you're not going to do that anymore because they, it can break off and it can choke your patient. So make sure that um, you don't put anything in the mouth. Um, remove, um, remove the patient, right? Um, put them to their side if possible so that they don't um, aspirate. And you want to make sure also that you move away any type of objects that they can hit and let the seizure pass. Okay, so no. Uh, it says even on page 547, the note never plays anything in the mouth of a seizing patient because it's going to treat, it's going to cause them to have a blockage in the airway. Okay. And then status epilepticus um, is basically a prolonged seizure, okay, when a person suffers two or more convulsive seizures and they never regain consciousness. So H1, what's the difference between status epilepticus and epilepsy? Well, epilepsy, there's a tendency for them to regain consciousness afterwards. Status epilepticus they have multiple seizures, but they never regain consciousness, right? They just keeps on seizing and seizing and seizing, okay? And then page 548, pediatric notes, okay? Pediatric notes, the most common thing of why children get seizures is because of fever. Most common thing of why children get seizures is because of fever, okay? Right, moving on. Um, we also have the stroke, okay? Stroke is basically when there is a blockage, right? Uh, when there's a blockage in the artery of the brain because it's disrupted, such as a brain aneurysm, that can cause a stroke as well. Or there's bleeding in the brain. Um, that's going to cause a blockage of oxygen. And when the brain's not getting enough oxygen, that's, the brain's very sensitive to that. Okay? Um, we also have a thing called um, transient ischemic attack, so the TIA. When you guys hear TIA, I want you to equate that to a mini stroke. So that basically means somebody called 911. It's like, oh my gosh, my grandma's having a stroke. I think she's not moving. And when you guys get there, grandma's talking. She's like jamming to Beyonce or whatever. She's fine, right? She's fine. So that's called a transient. That means it passed through. Transient ischemic attack. So there's probably a blockage in the brain for a bit, and then it moved on. Okay, so that's called a mini stroke, okay? Uh, in your textbook as well, there's a thing called um, uh, expressive aphasia. Okay, so aphasia is a general term for difficulty in communication. Okay, so if they cannot talk properly because of a stroke, that's called expressive aphasia. If they cannot understand what you're saying, that's called receptive aphasia. So remember those two terms right there, expressive aphasia and receptive aphasia. So how do we assess patients with stroke? Well, we use the FAS acronym, F-A-S, okay, F-A-S. We have them, do, we test them by their facial droop, ask them to smile. We do the arm drifting, tell them to lift their arms and close their eyes, and if it's one arm's drifting. And their speech, we let them say a sentence or a simple phrase, and if they're slurring their speech, then it's possibly a sign of a, um, early signs and symptoms of stroke right there. And Anytime, anytime you find any one of those, it only takes one of those FA, between FA and S for your patient to be considered that they are having stroke, okay? And what can we do for our patients that are experiencing stroke? Well, you want to transport them right away because just like a cardiac emergency patient, you want your patient to, uh, to qualify for a treatment called thrombolytics, right? It's not something that you have to know at this time, but it's something that you need at least have an understanding. Basically, thrombolytics are, your patient's gonna be given a lot of medications that's gonna break those clots that are either in the brain or in the blood vessels, right? But it's that they can only qualify for that if the onset has started three, uh, um, three hours, right? right uh, the stroke has just happened three hours or less. This is why it's emphasized all the time Transport your patient right away. And that specific uh, issue one, what is the um, T? Oh, so the FAST acronym, yes. And the book, it doesn't have the T, but yes, there is a T on the FAST. Um, facial drooping, arm drifting, speech, and the T is test O2 saturation, okay? 
So that's called the Cincinnati Pre-Hospital Stroke Scale. That is called HM1. Cincinnati Pre-Hospital Stroke Scale. Yes. Can you say that one more time, the FAST acronym? Yes, FAST acronym stands for, F stands for facial drooping, A is arm, uh, arm drifting, S is for speech test, and then T is for test for O2 saturation. And that's Thank called, that's called the Cincinnati Pre-Hospital Stroke Scale. You're welcome. Last but not least, syncope and dizziness. Syncope is just basically a bougie word or a medical word for fainting, right? So when you pass out because you saw your battle boo at the defect, you basically just had syncope. Okay? And there are several reasons of why patients go into syncope and or dizziness. It could be cardiovascular, the heart's not beating properly, breathing too slow. Um, it could be hypo hypovolemic causes, right? Hypovolemic means their bleed could be could be their bleeding out. Um, metabolic and structural causes that means that the electrolytes in their body is not well balanced. So that's why when you go out for like a long run, you don't hydrate properly. You pass out in the middle of your run. Okay. It could also be environmental and toxicological causes, right? So that could be you know, there's probably some toxins in the body that causes the patient to pass out, maybe because of the drugs that they are taking. And there are other causes as well that we don't know of called idiopathic causes, right? So every time you hear the word idiopathic, that basically means unknown causes. So how do we treat patients that have dizziness and syncope? Well, there's really not a lot we can do except administer them O2 and transport our patient. That's the only thing that we can do. And treat the injuries that they obtain if they fall flat on their face or their head, head, their head on the ground. Right? So that's basically your diabetic emergencies and altered mental status. Any questions for that class? Everybody good? Okay, good. And then the last one, very, very short, allergic reaction. Okay, allergic, allergic, allergic reaction. The allergic reaction, okay. we, um, allergic reaction is an exa exaggerated immune response. An allergen is anything that causes an allergy or allergic reaction. And then anaphylaxis is a severe or life-threatening type of an allergic reaction, right? So remember, allergic reaction does not mean anaphylaxis. Anaphylaxis is the specific term for a life-threatening um, allergic reaction. Um, hives is one of the reactions that your patient gets when you check their integumentary system. Your patient tends to get hives on their skin, right? How does allergic reaction happen? How many exposures happens for allergic reaction to take place? How many exposures? Very good. Two exposures, right? The first exposure, your body gets exposed to the allergen and the immune system produces antibodies. Second exposure, those antibodies connect to the allergen and release this a chemical called, what's that chemical that gets released that causes swelling, teary eyes, bronchoconstriction? Very good. Histamine, right? It produces a chemical histamine. So two exposures, right? Remember that, two exposures. Then um, we have a um, specific one of how we can distinguish anaphylaxis and mild allergic reaction. Let me see. What is or what are the two possible signs and symptoms that will determine an anaphylaxis from an allergic reaction? What are the only two things that will say, yep, if one of this is present, they definitely have um, anaphylaxis. Very good. Signs and symptoms of shock or respiratory distress. So only one of those needs to be present for me to label this as an anaphylaxis. Is that clear, class? So just because I'm having itchiness and hives, it doesn't mean I'm having allergic reaction. I mean, an anaphylaxis. I could be a mild allergic reaction, okay? So we're only admin the reason why you need to know this, because you're only administering epinephrine, okay, if your patient is experiencing anaphylaxis, okay? It's not meant for a mild allergic reaction. Is that clear, everyone? Okay, so here's my question. If your patient is exposed to an allergen, such as peanuts, they're allergic to peanuts, then uh, they're experiencing respiratory distress, but they do not have their own epinephrine, what do you do? What do you do? Patient doesn't have an epinephrine. What do I do? Call medical control. Um, not okay. Call medical control for permission to transport. Very good. You have to transport your patient right away because there's nothing really that we can do. I don't care if there's an epinephrine there, but it's not theirs. Okay, it has to be prescribed to the patient. 
okay? So what about your patient was exposed to peanuts and they're allergic to peanuts. Um, they have hives, but there's no respiratory distress. There's no signs and symptoms in shock. Your patient seems like they have stable vital signs and they also have a prescribed epinephrine. Do you or do you not administer the epinephrine? Very good, you don't. You just continue on with your assessment. Because remember, we only administer epinephrine if, okay, if they're experiencing mild, uh, I mean, not mild, if they're experiencing signs and symptoms of shock and respiratory distress. Is that clear, everybody? Okay, very good. Moving on. Okay, so how do we administer epinephrine? Well, very simple. Okay, first off, we verify the magical five rights, the expiration date, we, grab, we have our patient hold on to the epinephrine, and then we have them inject it to their lateral portion of their thigh and hold it there for how many seconds? 10 seconds. And then after that, we're gonna dispose of it in the biohazard container, and then we transport our patient right away. Remember, after every intervention, I want you guys to get used to transporting your patient right away. So after you give bronchodilator inhaler, epinephrine, epinephrine, glucose, nitroglycerin, transport your patient right away, okay? And then en route, you're gonna reassess your patient. Does that make sense, everyone? Okay, good. So, um, indications for, um, uh, for epinephrine, they have to have an allergic reaction, they have to have respiratory distress or shock, um, it has to be prescribed to them and medical direction has to authorize it. The dosage for adults, it's 0.3 milligrams, for infant and children, it's 0.15 milligrams, okay? Side effects of this, increased heart rate, dizziness, chest pain, headache, nausea, vomiting, okay? Right, and if you want clarifications on that one of what I was talking about on page 570, it says right there, 570, the sec third to the last sentence, the important thing to recognize in any patient is the presence of either respiratory distress or signs and symptoms of shock. That's the only one that one of these are the only one that needs to be present to be in anaphylaxis, okay? Last question, can I administer, can I administer a second dose of epinephrine to my patient? Can I administer it? Yes, only if, only if available. Very good, only if it's available, okay? Only if the patient has a second epinephrine with them or a third or a fourth and only if medical direction authorizes that okay so that's basically the one and a half hour review of those four uh, five chapters um is that good everybody you guys good with that review did i confuse any of you did i just like waste y'all's time you're the best agent one yeah i know tell me something i don't know jesus i'm kidding i'm kidding let me stay humble i'm sorry i'm not humble is not part of my tricks anyway any more questions guys Right, well, thank you so much for having an active reticular activating system. Nobody dozed off a lot of it. Okay, um, so if you don't have any more questions, then remember this is the part one. We're not gonna go over this tomorrow because tomorrow night we're just gonna go over four chapters and they're really, really short. Okay, they're very, very short chapters. And the reason behind that is because I want you guys to be able to have at least personal study time. Okay, I will try my best. Okay, keyword try my best. Williams to create a mock test just like what I did for mod one it's probably gonna be bombarded with multiple scenario questions because mod four is gonna be like a basic version of NREMT okay for my Air Force peeps it's not the same as NREMT but it's bombarded with med with scenarios so to prepare your brains for that expect I will try my best to start um, um, to start creating a mock test tonight and see if I can pick very hard scenario-based questions. I will pick 50 of them and start timing yourselves because the most, the reason why students fail is not because it's hard. They run out of time, okay? They run out of time because they're like, they read too slow. They don't know what they're looking for. So in order to prepare you guys, are you guys okay with that mock test tomorrow after a review session? Wonderful, right? So if you don't have any more questions, comments, or concerns, feel free to log out. I'm going to stop the recording at this point.